So let's kick off because this conversation today. I don't. I want to keep the uh, the uh, part of the session which is about you talking uh, as long as possible. So let's dive straight in. And my my uh, job here today is to introduce the session and to provide the background to the uh, 21st Century Challenges uh, project. Um, and I guess the, the starting point for the project was in 2015 when we celebrated 25 years of PPG 16 and the creation of uh, Historic England, uh, morphing out of English heritage, both in 2015, in April and November respectively of that year. And that, that set the seeds for this project. When the new organisation Historic England was created, that gave us an opportunity for a fairly root and branch review of our policy and practice right across the board. But part of those, one of those reviews was to look at our relationship with current archaeological practice. Why did we do that? Well, we particularly wanted to update our thinking to be clear about what historic England should be doing now in relation to archaeological practice, um, why we should be doing that, and what things were better left to others, to other organisations. So we wanted to get that straight in our minds. We wanted to be sure that our stance on archaeology um, better reflected the dominance now of the commercial sector in archaeological practice in England and indeed in the UK more widely. And of course, we also felt it was necessary inevitably to reflect the fact that our funding from government, like so many other public organisations, has been under pressure and in real terms for historic England between 20, 2010 and 2020 will have declined by something in, in excess of 50%. And that, again, has to be reflected in the way we think about what we do in relation to archaeology. Um, since 1990, uh, English Heritage had been treating the archaeological resource quite properly as an integral part of the historic environment. Uh, and we continue, the organisation continues to do so, of course. But reflecting about archaeological practice, it did occur to us that in doing so, in adopting that holistic viewpoint, it may have led, led us on occasion to neglect some important issues that related, that were specific to the manage, ma management of the buried and the submerged uh, archaeological resource, resource. So, for example, the very different basis on which the buried and built elements of the historic environment are discovered, how they're evaluated, and how they're offered statutory protection, and then the really quite significant implications that that has for how they're handled in the planning process. So that was factored into our thinking as part of this re review as well. When we commenced our review, we were clear that we weren't alone, and that others were also thinking about the conduct of archaeology in the UK, notably Scottish colleagues who were dealing with the uh, Scottish archaeological strategy, but also the British Academy, particularly academic colleagues, who were uh, going through a series of meetings and a publication uh, called the Reflections on Archaeology Project. Um, at the same time, we were also aware that uh, a lot of European colleagues were discussing how the future of the discipline might evolve in Europe and the strengths and weaknesses of the commercial approach. And in 2017, French colleagues were particularly focused on that as they prepared it for what they saw was a very significant election, which may have had significant implications for the way they do their work. And if you like, there was quite a pointed conversation going on about the pros and cons of a commercial approach to archaeology. Um, what we were clear about, despite the fact that the British Academy's Reflections <coughs> project was in hand, was that we did not want to replicate that. And that what we wanted to do was to try and look at something that was more applied in terms of uh, thinking about archaeological practice than that project. So in many ways, the two projects were perhaps complementary, but certainly not in competition. The way we conducted the review, there's a sort of twin track approach. Internally, within Historic England, um, we took a series of thematic papers, uh, policy papers, about various aspects of archaeological practice to our statutory advisory 
committee and got very useful feedback on that. For those of you who are interested, some of that, the outcomes of that internal process are about to be published in the latest Historic Environment Policy and Practice, uh, where we've called the paper Archaeology in the State We're In, Defining a Role for Historic England in the Archaeological Practice of the 21st Century. But that was only part of the review process, the, the inward-looking part of the process, if you like. In parallel, we also um, commissioned CIFA to, to jointly host a series of six workshops together with preceding uh, online discussions in order to address some of the topics that we've been considering internally. I must stress um, that our selection of those six topics by no means meant that we thought those were the, the only significant challenges for archaeology in the 21st century. But they were focused on a particular set of pressing issues in terms of professional practice, and they linked closely to what we've been discussing internally within Historic England as well. And I'm sure we will expand on that in discussion. In many ways, the process picked up the baton of the 2011 Southport uh, Review, but doing it when we did meant it was informed really by a good understanding of the pretty significant medium-term impacts of the 2008 financial crisis, not least its implications for public spending, in a way that the Southport Report in 2011 couldn't yet do. Uh, but as part of this project, uh, one of our first steps was to commission Taryn Nixon to undertake a study, uh, a quick appraisal of progress since Southport, so that we knew um, what had been achieved since that report. So, the 21st Century Challenges Project comprised six um, discussions, uh, both online in advance of six independently facilitated workshops. They were very open discussions. They were carried out on a sort of Chatham House rule basis uh, with a focus group of invited expert participants. Um, they were England focused, but we were very pleased that we were able to have colleagues from um, Scotland and Wales join us to give us very useful uh, input and insight from what was happening in the other devolved administrations. All of those uh, workshops had pre-circulated background papers and sets of questions to help people focus and to help the conversation flow, all of which were published on the TIFA website in advance. And the emphasis throughout all of those workshops was very much on practical delivery. What can the sector do to address these issues in practical terms that can really make a difference? We were really keen that these shouldn't just become talking shops. It was a broad-based process. The workshops involved around 170 individuals, and the online discussions involved nearly 80, so we felt it was, uh, it was pretty broad-based. But I said, as I said at the beginning, today is the next step in the process, an opportunity to take stock on where we've got to and to engage you to test the thinking that is emerging from those workshops. So, don't be shy when we get on to the discussion sessions. I'm sure you won't be. In a moment, Jan's going to speak to some of those main themes and uh, content coming from those uh, workshops. But I just wanted to touch on one point before I finish, which is one key conclusion from our own internal review. And that is, we looked at um, the context of English archaeology in a broader European context. And as I said at the beginning, very lively debates going on about the future of European archaeology. But what is clear is that English archaeology is one of the, if not the most, deregulated approaches to archaeology uh, in Europe at the moment, as we still are. Um, and we think that's unlikely to change in the foreseeable future. So a key um, conclusion of our review, which was endorsed by our advisory committee, was that a strong <laughs> professional institute able to self-regulate its membership, working in partnership both with local and central government is absolutely critical if the discipline is to continue to thrive. And that's why we were delighted to engage in this project in partnership with CIFA, and we're, why we're delighted to be here today to continue that conversation. And having said that, I will now hand over to Jan, who's got the hard job, I think, 
of running us through uh, what the workshop's all about.